This is The Mud Peddlers, a podcast where two nerdy ceramic artists share the behind the scenes of their worlds of clay. We are your hosts, Lindsay M. Dillon. And I am Dante of Earth Nation. Here's the thing. You have a question? No, I have a thing that I'm going to read. Am I part of the thing? I don't have to be a part of the thing. You're not a part of the thing, but I need you to not laugh. So I kind of think I maybe need you to go outside for like 10 minutes. Is it a laughable content? No, I don't think so. It's just very, it's very... I'm going to okay, laugh so, at it though. So basically, yeah, and, and then you're going to make me laugh and it's going to ruin the mood. Okay. So no, no, no. Stay here for, for, for a second. No, you told me to go outside. Okay, go all right, outside. all right, all right. Okay, go outside. Okay, go outside. No, I'm just, and I'm not going to look at you. Because don't, I'm just going to go around the corner. You're still probably going to be able to hear me. Because I know me and I know you and I'm either going to trigger you yeah. or I'm going to get triggered in general yeah. from whatever cheese you're about to smear on the yeah. hot dog. <laughs> I don't know why I said that. <laughs> I don't know why I said hot dog. I'm sorry. That is okay. It's gonna sound, the patrons have to tell me if it's cheesy later. Yeah. Tell them, tell them, tell them, tell them. I'm gonna go on my Instagram and talk about how. Okay, all right, bye, Dante. I'm gonna train my chair so I don't want to. This door so strong. Because it's, because I, it's, it, I need to clear out the pathways. WD 40. All right, okay. All right, don't look at me. Turn away. I'm gonna go around the corner. Oh, good. Okay, I'll come get you when I'm done. <laughs> all right listeners so here's the thing i have been a huge fan of this podcast called the magnus archives for years and it's a it's a horror anthology podcast based on the idea that there is this um institute called the magnus institute and they essentially take account of people's supernatural experiences Ooh, adjusting my chair so Oh, I'm kind of nervous. All right. So anyway, so I ended up essentially taking a crazy ass dream that I had and writing it in a short story form as though it was a statement issued by someone who had gone into the Magnus Institute. And it's, uh, I, I embellish some of the details, so not everything is true, um, but the baseline of the dream is true. So I'm just going to go ahead and <clears throat> I'm just going to go ahead and read it. So, all right. Statement of Amy O'Connor. Regarding a dream about her co-worker. Statement recorded and transcribed for the Magnus Institute by Lindsay M. Dillon. Statement begins. I don't really know why I'm here. It's not like you're the Dream Interpretation Institute. I actually have a friend who got her PhD in Jungian psychology, and even she didn't think my dream was a big deal. But still, you take walk-ins, and my shift ended at noon, so... I figured, why not? Just pop off the bus a couple stops earlier. Maybe if I just get this all out, I'll get over this stupid nagging feeling. Anyway, I always had a bit of a crush on Eric. We met six months into my job as a barista, and when he joined me for his first shift, notebook in hand, blue eyes, and a haircut straight out of the 1920s, I knew my job just got a little harder. But I kept it together, explaining how we took orders from customers and where we stored the cups with what I hoped was clear, untainted professionalism. We ended up working most shifts together in the coming months, and he turned out not only to be the kind of attractive that made me feel like I was in middle school again, but a genuinely lovely person. He liked plants, doing beer tasting at the local breweries, and having a good cry when the right movie brought it out in him. <sighs> Repeat untainted professionalism. I guess it's not all that strange I had a dream about him. People have dreams about their crushes all the time, right? But then, this wasn't really the kind of dream you'd expect, and after what happened last week... Well, let me just start with the dream. I was in a lift, driving over to Eric's house. I knew in that dream logic way that he'd invited me to dinner with his family, and despite the fact that we'd never even hung out after a shift, I'd said yes. So we'd set a date for the following Tuesday, the one day we both had off from work that week. I was so giddy, I didn't even question why dinner was so late. I mean, I should have. I mean, who has dinner at 11 at night? Still, I sat in the back of that car, fidgeting with excitement as we turned down one identical suburban street after another. The excitement also helped me overlook the fact that all of the houses, which surely had big families and looked far more welcoming in the daylight, not a single one had a single car in their driveways. 
We arrived and I stood on the curb looking up at yet another stark house with dark windows as my lift disappeared around the corner and back into the labyrinthian neighborhood. I was beginning to suspect I'd put in the wrong address when Eric opened the front door. He waved and shouted a welcome, that friendly and inviting smile I saw often these days, oddly out of place against the cookie cutter building that was apparently his home. I thanked him for having me over and I apologized for running late. He just gave me another one of those smiles and said, it's fine, Amy, don't worry about it. Under normal circumstances, the inside of Eric's house would have had me filled with unbridled glee. Maroon wallpaper with crimson filigree covered every wall. Elaborate wall sconces with oxidized speckling held real wax candles. And grim-faced ancestors in even grimmer clothing seemed to watch us from their portraits as we walked down the hallway. The whole thing looked like Dorian Gray had designed an exclusive social club for vampires using only the images in my interior design folder on Pinterest. But all I could feel were thin tendrils of anxiety beginning to strangle the butterflies in my stomach. The wallpaper bore nicks and scratches near the baseboards. The light from the candles seemed to fight for existence against a darkness too thick and too heavy for shadows. And there was a hungry fervor in the eyes of those ancestors that didn't match the thin, demure lines of their lips. Those tendrils brushed against my heart when Eric opened the door to the dining room. His whole family of twelve sat along a long, dark, wooden dinner table, clothed in identical robes of charcoal gray and what must have at once been a rich garnet red. They wore tall, pointed hats of the same color that looked like the Pope had taken sartorial advice from a certain group of southern assholes. It would have been as comedic as it was creative, but the look in their eyes as they turned as one to face me told me that this was anything but cosplay. We talked during dinner, I'm sure we did. I'm not sure what we talked about or how I heard it over the buzzing in my head, but I'm sure we talked. That's what people do, right? All at once, everyone stood and began making their way out of the room. Befuddled but still able to pick up on social cues, I followed. We backtracked through the hallway, through the front door, and down the front steps. Eric came to me as his family began walking down the street, forming two loose columns on the empty black asphalt. I asked him where we were going, what was going on. I apologized, though I wasn't quite sure what for. Eric took my hand, intertwining his fingers in mine, and led me into the street to follow his family. It's fine, Amy. Don't worry about it, he said with a smile that didn't quite reach his eyes. We ended up in a park. Not like a flat, single city block's worth of half-dead grass and a basketball court. More like an aged expanse of nature that some urban druid with family money and a seat on the city council decided would not go gently into that good night. It probably had a volunteer corps that tended to it a couple times a month, but something in the gnarled joints of the trees and the darkness of the shadows between them suggested that the volunteers never made it very far in. We would, though. Hand in hand, Eric and I followed his family deeper and deeper into the trees. And then the buzzing began again. I felt myself stumble forward, the uneven ground beneath me becoming an increasingly tenuous anchor to reality. And then from nowhere, this random part of a nature documentary came to mind. Did you know when a wasp invades a beehive, bees will pile on top of it, surrounding it and buzzing and vibrating until the cumulative heat of their tiny bodies kills the deadly interloper. Remembering this, the buzzing seemed to fade a little, but just for a moment. But in that moment, I realized that Eric's family wasn't just having a quiet after-dinner stroll through this frightening facsimile of a park. They were marching. And they were chanting. The words sounded like something I should understand, but their meaning dissipated as quickly as my muddled mind perceived them. And they hurt. I don't know how, but the words hurt, and when the buzzing returned and dulled their sharp edges, I welcomed the respite. And then it all stopped. 
the buzzing, the chanting, even the walking. As I opened what I realized had been my closed eyes, I found myself standing alone, some 20 yards away from a tree line of sycamores and pines wrapped in shadows that seemed to breathe. I turned around and saw Eric standing a few feet behind me. My eyes struggled to focus, though I could see his family standing farther behind him, arranged in a wide semicircle. I tried to say something, to form some combination of words that would capture the fear and confusion, that would ask for the help and relief I knew I needed even if I couldn't begin to grasp what it was from. Something started to come out of my mouth when I heard the twig snap. It was louder than it should have been, and it broke through the haze in my mind like a foghorn. I looked down to see a small, broken stick tumble past my feet. I watched it, turning to face the line of trees it disappeared into. Then there was another snap, and a twig to my left rolled and jerked its way like a ruined puppet across the green and into the shadow. Then another snap. Then another in quick succession, then another, then another, and another, and in seconds, the forest swelled with a frantic chorus of rending as sticks and branches, seen and unseen, charged towards the dark congregation of trees ahead of me. It sang of rapture and apotheosis. It screamed of becoming and destruction. And as my head swam with the cacophony, I watched those sticks and branches build something, or be built into something. At the edge of the shadows, between the Stygian blackness and the anemic glow of a moon I couldn't see, I watched and heard wood bend and break itself into a shape that emerged from the trees as a tangle of earth and wood, as a massive, shambling miscreation that the darkness clung to, even as it stepped on countless, breaking legs into view. I, I didn't realize I'd been moving until my back hit Eric's chest. I froze breathless and staring as his hands wrapped around my shoulders. I asked him, I must have asked him, what the fuck that thing was. I must have asked him because I turned around and Eric, his smile a pale wound in his face and his eyes as empty as the starless sky, spoke with a painful cadence of sounds turned into words that the buzzing didn't even have the chance to dull. It's fine, Amy. Don't worry about it. I broke from him and ran. I ran faster than I know I can in real life, and I ran for a long, long time. I ran far enough that I should have reached the edge of the park. I should have made it out of the park, past Eric's house, even as far as the cafe where this whole nightmare had started. But no matter where or how far I ran, all I could see were trees wrapped in shadow that seemed to breathe, and sticks tumbling towards me against the wind. And that's it. It was just, just a weird dream, I'm sure. Just my brain combining some horror movie tropes with the guy I like in a really, really messed up way. Thing is, Eric asked me to dinner last week. He said he hoped he wasn't being inappropriate, but that he thinks I'm an interesting person, and... Since he knows how much I like big families, he wondered if I'd like to come over for dinner to meet his. I said yes, of course, but then I started thinking about that dream again. I even looked up his address, and sure enough, it's right in the middle of a suburban housing development that went up about five years ago. But I'm being silly. Untainted professionalism and all, I was so excited when he asked me. One stupid nightmare shouldn't stop me, right? Still, I have this feeling in my gut that won't go away, and the dream just felt so real, and... <sighs> no, you know what? I'm being ridiculous. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm sorry I made you listen to all that. <laughs> uh, I do feel a bit better, though, so thanks. I'll just see myself out. Wish me luck, I guess. I'm... I'm looking forward to dinner. That's it. Okay, oh, oh, I'm locked in. Oh, there it goes. I'm done. Done? Yeah. Fun. <laughs> so that's it. I hope that in the spirit, hold on. I hope that in the spirit of spooky season, <laughs> 
<laughs> Y'all enjoyed that cinematic reading, that, you know, vague attempt at, you know, doing spooky things. I'm very self-conscious, but I hope you enjoyed it. I had a lot of fun reading it. Don't be self-conscious. I'm sure they all have, um, they had a great time. I hope so. Some of you got your pants up. But... I mean, if you did, don't tell me. I don't want to know that. <laughs> tell me. <sighs> Don't tell him. So I can yell at you. Which turns them on more sometimes. Oh, that's true. That's a thing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Anyway. Some people pay for it. That's true. Do you have any last messages you want to leave our dear listeners with? Uh, yeah. Reduce your showers to underneath 10 minutes. You water wasters. Because <laughs> the real horror is environmental decay. Yep. Yay! Honestly, yeah. Yay! Yep. There's a lot of, lot of ants on this hill. Taking up a lot of dirt. Of sugar to go around. <laughs> <laughs> Are you trying to evil laugh? Yeah, it's not very good. Do you want me to do it? Yeah, evil laugh for us. Okay. Okay, all right. All right. Lean in. Lean in. <laughs> And that's it for today. Thank you so much for joining us for this episode of The Mud Peddlers. We would love to hear from you, so if you want to share your thoughts about the episodes or just see what Dante and I are working on in our studios, come say hi. You can find links to my social media at lindsaymdillon.com. That's L-I-N-D-S-E-Y, M as in monster, D-I-L-L-O-N.com. And you can visit my pottery shop or see what I'm working on at earthnationceramics.com. And you can find me all over social media at Earth Nation Ceramics. It's spelled exactly how you think it's spelled. And if you want to support the show, hear some bonus episodes, and see some behind the scenes of my work, you can support me and the show at patreon.com slash lindsaymdillon. Thank you so much for listening, and we will see you next time. <laughs>